Jeff Shara, the son of Michael Shara, is the author uh, just recently of a very important new book, The Last Full Measure. Um, as you will probably recognize, the line comes from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, where he speaks of those who died at Gettysburg as giving the last full measure of their devotion. And this um, ends or brings to completion a trilogy, the mid-portion of the war, uh, addressed in the great book The Killer Angels by Michael Shara, who received the Pulitzer Prize for it in 1975, but died rather young. His son, Jeff Shara, picked up the flag, as it were, and did a number of, a few years ago, a book titled Gods and Generals, which covers the first portion of the war and has now uh, written The Last Full Measure, which brings the war to completion. Uh, this is not history merely, it's history, of course, but it's written in novelized form and with some sense of the interior experience of the major actors in this war. Our other guest tonight is a Lincoln scholar and a scholar of the military aspect of the Civil War as well. Uh, Jerry Prokopovich is uh, a PhD in history uh, from Harvard, where he worked with uh, David Donald, one of the great scholars. David Donald was on this program a few years ago when he uh, had completed and was discussing his great work on Lincoln. Uh, Jerry Prokopovich is Lincoln Scholar and Director of Public Programs at the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana, of which institution we will probably want to speak a bit more before we are finished tonight. When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again, that song we started with, actually it's an old world soon, uh, song. It must come from the British Isles. The very sound of it has that clang. Do you, th do you think so? It, it certainly sounds like it. There were a lot of uh, Civil War songs that were adaptations. sets of words adapted to old yeah. tunes. But we're talking not about Johnny marching home, not yet. We'll get to that perhaps before we're done tonight, but about Johnny marching to the war. The crucial question about all great conflicts, of course, is was this trip, was this war necessary? Was it? Did it have about it the smack of historic inevitability? What do you think, Jeff? Well, I think it, was, uh, it probably was not preventable uh, at the time when the war actually broke out. I mean, many people have... have portrayed all these different scenarios of how the war, mm. if certain minute events had occurred in a different way, the war may never have happened. Uh, I don't know that at some point the, the clash of cultures was becoming so deep and, and the, uh, the really the, the uh, lack of, of cohesiveness in, the, in the, the different states was becoming so pronounced and the hostility from one part of the country to the other uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and it, it's not a simple yes or no answer. It's not a slavery issue. It's not a states' rights issue. It's both and probably 150 more issues. Uh, I think the conflict was coming. It's not a war about slavery, or not about slavery alone. Do you agree? Well, I'd, I would certainly agree, uh, Jeff, that it was not preventable at the time it occurred and that there were deep cultural divisions between the regions. I would uh, argue that, that slavery is really at the root of all those other cultural mm -hmm. divisions. Uh, as Lincoln says in the, in the second inaugural address, speaking of slavery, all knew that this was somehow the cause of the war. I think that puts uh, puts a finger on it as close as we're able to really do. It's hard to say exactly how it came about. Uh, no one really expected the North was going to go in and outlaw slavery in the South or that slavery would become a national institution in the North. Uh, but one way or another, that did underlie uh, the significant differences. Could it at the last minute, that is in the last month before hostilities began, before uh, the taking of Fort Sumter or the assault upon Fort Sumter, could it have been bargained away by good politicians? Well, actually, it could have been bargained away by bad politicians. I mean, had Lincoln conceded, uh, okay, we'll let you have Fort Sumter, we're not going to press that point, and had basically backed up uh, every step of the way to every demand that the southern states might have had or, or particular politicians might have had, sure, it could have been prevented. And, prevented, and what would have happened if you would have, you would have had secession? But the only prevention would have been to yield to the South and its claim. As long as the politicians in the South, and first and foremost in South Carolina, were pressing the issue, um, Lincoln had two choices. He could give in and let them have what they wanted to, which is to secede, or he could do something about it, ultimately he did something about then it. And what was happening south of the Mason-Dixon line in the year before the war? Who was really pressing? Well, the, the, the pressure came uh, in part from uh, 
uh, editors, uh, people leading the secession movement were, were mainly, not primarily mainstream politicians, uh, but there was a, a momentum of events that occurred through the 1850s, uh, the, the Dred Scott decision, the caning of Charles Sumner, the uh, uh, John Brown's actions in Kansas, and then again at Harper's Ferry. One thing after no another occurred that heightened tension until things were at a fever pitch, so that when Lincoln was elected, uh, even before he uh, took any action or was even inaugurated, the South, uh, many southern states had already decided to secede. As Lincoln rides from this city, from Chicago, to Washington on that train, did he know he was riding into a war? I don't think he knew it was going to be a war at that point. Uh, he, he made a lot of speeches along the way, basically with the same message, all will yet be well, and they gave the public the impression that he didn't know what was going on, that he, he was unaware of the depth of, of the mm -hmm. problem he was facing. If, if he was unaware, I think he learned very quickly. When he got to Washington, uh, we talked about uh, giving up Fort Sumter. He was willing, uh, according to some reports, to give up Fort Sumter if he could elicit from Virginia a promise not to secede. He said a state for a fort would not be bad business. Uh, didn't work out, but he was yeah. he was always willing to to take the practical uh, solution. Sure, I think the point too of whether or not anyone really expected a war, even as the guns began to fire, no one had any comprehension. It's very easy now in hindsight to say, well, four years the bloodiest war in our history. At the time, even soldiers who were volunteering were volunteering for 90-day terms. I mean, people believed this was going to be a loud shouting match <coughs> with a little bit of shooting, and then somebody was going to back down. There's no way that this would spin out of control the way it did. There's no way for anybody to have been able to measure in advance just what the Civil War would become. When World War II began, and nothing much happened for the first six months, really, the French referred to it as um, uh, un drôle de guerre. A joke of a war. Did we have a troll de guerre at the beginning? Well, I don't think so because of what happened at Manassas. Although, I'll actually, I'm sort of contradicting myself because, in a way, Manassas was a joke. The South had victory in their hands and literally could have chased the Union Army right back into the streets of Washington and didn't stop short of that, which probably, I, I don't know that it would have ended the war, but could have ended the war right there in July of 1861. Um, whether that's a joke or not, I don't think it's a joke to the people who fought on the ground at Manassas, but it's a joke in the sense that nobody really knew what they were doing. I mean, and McDowell didn't know what he was doing, leading the Union troops. The picnickers who come out from Washington to sit on the hillside watching this grand parade had no idea what they were going to be seeing, and even the Confederate commanders <clears throat> had very little idea what lay, what truly lay in their grasp. You really had picnickers sitting up on the hills watching the, the battle? You did. Uh, Bull Run really was uh, the clash of the, the amateur armies. Neither Either side mm -hmm. knew what they were getting into. You had civilians from Washington out to watch. You had something of uh, the, the uh, phony war, the Sitzkrieg uh, effect through April, May, and, and, and June of 1861 while the two armies are, are assembling themselves before the battle at Bull Run. Uh, <laughs> but they were untrained. They were amateurish. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the Southern Army wasn't just as disorganized by victory at Bull Run as the Union Army was disorganized by defeat. Their, their failure to press onto Washington uh, uh, was certainly uh, noticeable, but I, I wondered that they actually could have done so, even if had someone given the order. When they've pulled the various armies and uh, all the regiments that make up the the armies together, when finally all the forces are arrayed, what what kind of force is there on both sides? In terms of size, size uh, and uh, ordnance and general potency. Well, you, you have a you have an interesting situation because the two armies are mirror images of each other. They're both. Uh, uh, they are amateur armies, as, as mm -hmm. I said. They're they are not with amateur generals, however. A sprinkling of West Point professionals, a few hundred. Uh, uh, the Mexican War veterans. The, the, the veterans mm -hmm. of the Mexican mm -hmm. War, but and they are on both sides. On both sides, the Confederate generals are, are West are, Pointers also. That's right. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, uh, anyone, uh, uh, the, the 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 line officers, the the company officers, the regimental officers, are all amateurs, and. The regiments themselves are made of these enthusiastic men who uh, enlist for 90 days uh, at the beginning and then in terms of three years later on the Union side. And they don't know anything about war, but they do feel strongly about the causes of the conflict, and they do know each other, which is very significant, because then when they join these regiments, they are serving next to people who have known all their lives. You're with the boys you went to school with. The boys you went to school with, the boys you're going to go home with, so you can't... If you peer. commit an act of cowardice, you can't right. run and hide anywhere. Right. Uh, peer pressure. Peer pressure is enormous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so you develop on both sides armies with extremely strong unit cohesion at the small level, extremely strong esprit de corps among these regiments, and thus the armies are very hard to defeat. Uh, they, they can take a huge beating, but the men ah. rejoin their regiments when it's over. They come back to the flag. Is that your view of it, Jeff, that on either side uh, they were resilient armies? Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm often asked uh, this, this strange opinion that floats around uh, that man for man, the southern soldier was a better fighter than mm -hmm. his Union counterpart. I don't believe that for a minute. Uh, I think every... Uh, every regimental history, when you when you look at the the microcosms of these fights, uh, the Union soldier was every bit as good a fighter as the Confederate soldier, and uh, it was the command structure that was the problem. But uh, when we're if we're talking about from the ground up, uh, clearly every person who enlisted in this fight enlisted with a certain amount of zeal. I mean, there had to be a reason to draw this fellow, but they were not drafted right off the bat. They they picked up a gun to fight and possibly to die for something that was important to them. Uh, that that kind of of incentive to fight uh, it comes from a variety of reasons. I mean, uh, it's it's hard when we t we're talking about slavery. I don't think every single soldier on either side had slavery in his mind when he picked up a gun. But you know, maybe a, a number of other issues, and certainly the peer pressure. If you in your hometown, everybody you went to school with is signing up to go. Chances are you'd sign up to go. No. Uh, here's a little fantasy for you, but play along with me. Suppose we get in a satellite up there. Uh, and it's a, it's stationary. It's over the United States, over the eastern half of the United States. But it's also a time machine, and we can turn time back to 1961, middle of 1961. But we're looking now at the whole continent. What do we see in terms of the location of armies, the correlation of forces, the strategic uh, presentation before? the war gets fully launched. Well, I, I think the first thing we do is move our satellite away from the eastern half over to the western half of the yeah. country. <laughs> because that's really where the war is going to be won Other side lost. of the Mississippi? Right. No, uh, I, I guess I'm speaking in 1860s terms. The western half is west of the, the Appalachian, yeah. Allegheny yeah. Mountain. Uh, west of the Mississippi is still no man's land as, as far as white America is concerned at that time. Uh, but there you see the Mississippi River, which is critical. That yeah. that uh, divides the Confederacy, uh, the the western states of uh, part of Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas are on the other side. That's the heart of commerce for the the great Northwest, for Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Uh, the rivers are going to be critical. Uh, that's how you can move troops uh, rapidly. How you can move the supplies, even more important than the troops. Uh, but where do we see the troops uh, laid out? Uh, before things really heat up, you, you see them along the rivers. You see, mm -hmm. well, you see Kentucky, uh, a theoretically neutral state, a state that, that attempts to sit out the conflict at the beginning in 1861. Mm -hmm. So you see northern troops at Cincinnati, uh, at, at Cairo, at places along the Ohio. You see southern troops at Nashville, south of uh, Kentucky, and at uh, uh, points along at Memphis and other points north along the Mississippi. But in the east, we've got the the big arm, the big federal army in and around Washington, McClellan's army, and we've got the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, you've got, you have Joe Johnston's army and Beauregard's army in Northern Virginia uh, and the, the, north of, the northern part of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, I mean, Lee is a non-figure at this point. He's in Richmond. Um, What's he doing there? Well, it, it, he's essentially sitting in an office. Um, at first, what he's doing is he's organizing the, the Virginia Defense Forces, which then become incorporated into mm -hmm. the Confederate Army. Lee is one of the last officers to actually become a Confederate officer. He's, a, he's an officer of the state of Virginia, major general in the state of Virginia. Uh, he finally becomes a Confederate officer, and he sits in an office uh, essentially serving the whims of Jefferson Davis. He's, a, he's appointed as official advisor to the president, which really means very little little because Davis is not taking advice from anybody. But beyond that, I think what you also have is the Federal Navy, and this ties in again with what Jerry was saying with the rivers. <coughs> if you're looking at, at the, the distribution of force all over the, the United States from your satellite, one of the things you see is the oceans and the rivers, the mouths of the rivers, you have an enormous Federal Navy that the Confederacy could not match. And that was, in, in maybe in some ways, that predetermined how the war would come out before the first gun was fired. Did it really? How do you reason that? Well, because, it, first of all, the, the blockade was, was Winfield Scott's idea, I believe. That this was an idea that if you can choke off the Confederacy uh, from their supplies, from overseas, from Europe, if you cut off their, their lines of commerce, you cut off the income to wage war, uh, you'll either starve the government or you'll starve the people.
And clearly the Federal Navy had the power to do this, to blockade the major ports, to cut off the rivers. The defeat that the Confederacy suffered along the Mississippi River, which came later, um, really just sealed that. It was always inevitable from the time the Federal Navy first started sealing up the ports. Then you would argue that the outcome was inevitable by virtue of the Federal Sea Power. The outcome, I think, was inevitable because of that with the intangibles thrown in. And this is what makes a difference in the war. If you look at what Lee did at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, if you look at Lee at Second Manassas, these battles that Lee won uh, or were handed to him uh, regardless, mm -hmm. uh, what you see is th the big intangible, which is a man who, or an army, who can defeat its adversary uh, close to Washington, close to the, quote, media center, uh, the, the, the governmental centers where you make people really nervous who are the decision-making people and Lee could have pulled it off with the right combination of victories regardless of the seaport situation regardless of the strength of the Navy and regardless of what was happening in the West um, what he, the fact is he didn't do that I mean Gettysburg was his last shot and when he couldn't do that then it definitely was inevitable that suggests to me that what we need to look at or one way to look at this is to examine uh, the spirit of the Confederacy, the organization of the Confederacy for war, and the failure to take Washington, the failure to win in the East, where if they had taken Washington and knocked over the federal government, so to speak, the naval blockade uh, would not have ended their prospects. They could have now undone that as well. Well, I don't believe that taking Washington was ever in the equation. I mean, there was never any illusion that they had the power to overcome Washington. Mm -hmm. The idea was to move into Pennsylvania and simply to, by being there, by being on northern soil, just to threaten, just to, yeah. just to make the people in Washington believe that they might try to take Washington, or that they could. Well, who they were, how they planned their military strategy, what, how they maintained their morale, the Confederates and the Confederacy, is something I think we ought to focus on. What was the nature of the spirit of the Confederate soldiers? Well, the, the Confederate soldiers were very uh, determined. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier the, the, uh, the spirit motivating soldiers on both sides. Uh, the Civil War was a very ideological war, and soldiers north mm -hmm. and south felt very strongly about what they were fighting for. Uh, and, and it's not easily defined. It's not easy to say, well, it was slavery or it was a single mm -hmm. issue. Uh, but there was a sense that the survival of the South, that its independent culture, its identity, depended on this war. And uh, soldiers, whether they were slave owners themselves or, or not, or even not likely to become slave owners, uh, felt very strongly about the independence of their, of their section. Uh, as the war went on, uh, you see a development of something of a cult of personality in the Army of Northern Virginia uh, around General Lee. Uh, Stonewall Jackson also to some extent, but he was killed at Chancellorsville in 63. Uh, but by the end of the war, there are soldiers who, who may have forgotten what exactly they enlisted for, except <laughs> Mars Robert is still out there, and they will still keep fighting for him. Yeah, exactly. Then we need to talk about him. He's, of course, a central figure in uh, Jeff Shara's uh, novelized version of the history of the last uh, third of the Civil War. The Last Full Measure is the title of the book. It's just published by Ballantine Books. And uh, he comes through still as rather the mythic Robert E. Lee, except for inside his head. Well, I, I actually, I'm really sorry to hear you say that, because one of the things I was, well, I mean, I really tried to get away from was the myth. Um, well, you know, by mythic, I merely mean he still comes through as a noble figure. Well, I believe he is a noble figure, yeah. and I, there is a, I think there's a distinction between the, the mythical mm. Lee, the Lee who is godlike uh, even mm. today to many people in the South uh, or all over the country. Uh, this is a man who I believe, and in my description of him is based on as much original research as I could get my hands on. This is a man of enormous integrity, of dignity, personal dignity, uh, a man who is deeply devout, deeply religious, a man who fully places himself into the hands of his own, of what he perceives God to be, and believes that every aspect of his life is a result of God's will. This is a man who carries an enormous guilt for the, the lousy father he has been. This is a man who has seven children. He spends 30 years in the United States Army not being there to help raise the children. His wife is pretty bitter about that. This is a crippled woman, a woman with, uh, uh, stricken with arthritis, who is not too happy with her husband. I mean, it's a difficult relationship the two of them have. Um, and yet, through all that, I think what Lee substitutes for his family is this army and these characters. And what the emotion that he rarely shows his troops, he does occasionally show to his staff. And I've had people question me on that, that their perception of Lee is, a, is the, the, the cold, uh, the aloof, uh, 
the man who never dared not reveal what was really going on, and yet from his staff officers, he could get angry, and he could lose his temper around the camp, but this was not the perception that the average soldier had. It was almost a father-son relationship between Lee and his army. And what was his military plan? What, for that matter, was his military competence? Was he really the best general they had? Well, he, he was certainly an outstanding general in many ways uh, in, in the planning and conduct of the campaigns in the East. Uh, the results speak for themselves. There, there are places in the country where you cannot say a bad word about General Lee without running great personal risk, but I'll go ahead and try anyway. Uh, in terms of overall strategic vision, the Confederacy did not really implement any through the war. Uh, Jefferson Davis, the president, did not impose one, and Lee, as the most prestigious general and as eventually the commander-in-chief of the Southern armies, did not impose one either. He tended to focus on Virginia. He, he joined the Southern cause because Virginia seceded, and he fought for Virginia to a large extent. So in 1863, when the South has some conceivable chance of uh, prolonging the war, at least uh, by sending troops e uh, troops to the West. Uh, Lee sends uh, Longstreet's Corps out to help the Western armies, but he himself does not go. Uh, if Lee had left uh, someone else in charge uh, during during the winter months and gone out, he might have accomplished more. If he had well, what's what's that issue out in the West? Where in the West? Uh, the West at that point uh, is is Tennessee. The Union armies. Uh, by mid-1863 have seized the entire Mississippi River. Grant has taken Vicksburg. Uh, Rosecrans in the central theater is moving on Chattanooga. Uh, Braxton Bragg is, is, is trying to stop him. Lee does send troops from the Army of Northern Virginia out to join Bragg's army, and in September of 1863 at Chickamauga, uh, they defeat Rosecrans' army and bottle it up in, in the town of Chattanooga. And there's an opportunity there. There's another opportunity in 1864 when... Uh, uh, Joe Johnston's forces in the West, this time retreating from Chattanooga to Atlanta, are holding up Sherman's army. Again, Lee is fighting two separate wars. He focuses on what he has to do, and it's it's a Herculean task to stop Grant's army. But there's no coordination between his efforts and those of Johnston in front of Atlanta. Uh, and you're suggesting he's he held too many forces back. Well, he he didn't have with his Virginia concerns. Yes, he didn't have any authority, really. I mean, he was right. not the commander-in-chief. Jefferson Davis was as president. No. But Lee was the only person with enough prestige in the South to have gone to Davis and said, we need to send uh, a couple divisions out to uh, Johnston, or we, in 63, need to do something to help Pemberton at Vicksburg. And I gather you're both quite persuaded that Jefferson Davis had no overall strategic view of the war. No, certainly not. And I think Davis was was probably the Confederacy's biggest problem, because as, as administrator, as commander-in-chief, it's his job to sort of control everything and coordinate everything. In fact, he was doing the opposite. He was uncoordinating things. Things. He would he would govern by minute detail and govern by personal favor and Braxton Bragg's a great example. Braxton Bragg uh, fails miserably at Chattanooga, allows Grant's army to escape uh, the confines where they're really in a very serious situation, and. Davis brings him back to Richmond because Bragg is a friend of his and, and puts him uh, in charge of the, the, the forces in Richmond, and, and he becomes Davis's advisor. I mean, uh, Jefferson Davis was a man who fa I think fancied himself the ideal commander. He wanted to be a soldier. Uh, he was not comfortable being an administrator, just a, a, a civilian administrator. He wanted to get out there in the field. He, he fantasizes about standing side by side with Robert E. Lee facing the enemy. Uh, that's not what you need in a president, especially not in a president yeah. of a disjointed bunch of independent states. Uh, you need to be a, the, a, the master diplomat and the master politician, and Davis was neither one. The, the ironic point there is uh, Abraham Lincoln had similar fantasies at one point after... Mm -hmm. uh, Gettysburg, when Lee's army is allowed to retreat following the defeat it suffers at Gettysburg, uh, Lincoln says to one of his secretaries, I could have gone up there and whipped them myself, and, and he has half a mind to actually go up there and do that. Uh, but he has a better sense and doesn't. Davis has some grounds for his fantasies because he was a West Pointer. He had fought in the Mexican War. Uh, he had done well there. And his his pedigree was about the same as many of the generals who do become famous in the war. So he felt kind of cheated that he was given a civil post, even if it was president. Rather what than was he general. directly before the war? Was he a member of the Senate, wasn't he? He was the senator from Mississippi. The senator, senator from Mississippi. Well, right, he was also secretary of war at one time. In the earlier, in which administration? Yes. That was um, uh, Pierce. Polk's administration. Yes. Yeah.
Yes, I mean, he, he did have experience. I mean, it's not like he was completely unqualified for the job. The problem is, and I don't know if this is a health issue, he was certainly a hypochondriac as well as suffering from real uh, ailments of one kind or another. Uh, but he he was too much addicted to detail and he wanted to put his finger on every single pulse in the confederacy he wanted to run every department and be, he got himself involved when he should have stayed above the fray he became the fray he, he would stick his nose mm -hmm. into everybody's business he would manage uh, the army particularly I mean, we were talking about the, the military uh, I mean he created his own boundaries of where one man's uh, authority stopped and another man's began the worst example right off the top of my head I can think of is Petersburg uh, when Grant is crossing the James River he's moving from Davis's from one department commanded by Lee to another department commanded by Beauregard and the two men uh, have a fairly general disdain for each other and there's poor communication in the face of, a, of the most serious threat to the Confederacy. Is this the way wars were fought generally in the 19th century? That is, uh, various prima donnas with their own armies in the field, not necessarily in cooperation. No grand plan overall coordinating their uh, the movements of the separate armies and units. I don't know if that would apply to, to Napoleon. Well, Napoleon. Napoleon, you have a single person, yeah. so he, he everything is in his. But head. of course, right. you don't have telegraphic communication. Right. Uh, By the Civil War, you do. No, right. for Napoleon, you don't. Out of Napoleon, if, even if he had a grand plan, how did he execute it when uh, it would take? a day or two for a messenger to get to some distant army, or it might take a week. It, it, it's a, a mystery, and the, the improvement in communication, the invention of the telegraph, uh, does in some ways prove to be a mixed blessing, because it does allow someone like Jefferson Davis to micromanage yeah. elements of the war. And Lincoln to, to experiment with micromanaging. There are telegrams he writes early in the war where he's telling General Fremont, send a gunboat from this town to that town, uh, something the commander-in-chief ought not to be bothering himself with. By 1863, you can see Lincoln uh, uh, maturing in his role, learning to use this new technology. Uh, in 61, when the Confederates invade Kentucky for the first time, he's busy moving one regiment from one town to another. In 1863, when they invade, he sends a one-line telegram to Halleck that says, they're having a stampede in Kentucky. Please look to it. Hmm. Uh, that's it. That's all he has to do is delegate it to his chief of staff and... and know that it'll go to the right people and be taken care of. It's not the commander-in-chief's job. Fascinating thing about history, and wars dramatize this great dilemma, this great enigma, is um, do certain crucial events turn us into a time path which we never would have gone down but for that crucial event going that way? Years ago, McKinley Cantor wrote a wonderful what-if novel, uh, what we would now call a... Uh, um, a uh, Al counter... Alternative history? It's an alternative or history, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or counterfactual, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, in which he had... I forget which particular incident in Gettysburg he has come out differently, whether it's, it's Pickett's Charge... Uh, or Ewell taking Cemetery Hill... Or Cemetery or, Hill or Round yeah, Top right, or something mm -hmm. like that. The mm -hmm. Confederates succeed where, in fact, they failed, and, they, and from that they win the Battle of Gettysburg, and the consequence of that, ultimately, is Confederate victory, and then the novel goes on to talk about uh, the life of the two nations, the United States and the Confederate States of America. Well, I think it would have been more, actually, I mean, if we want to pursue, you know, the alternative part of this, I mean, this is great fun to do this because you can mm -hmm. do it all night. Uh, I think it would have been many more than two nations. I would have had, I think you would have had the North probably from Illinois to New England as one country. You would have had California as an independent country. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they would have fallen under the control of the Spanish again is hard would to say. Would the Confederacy have held together? I don't believe so. I think, first of all, Texas would have been the first to go because Texas was already an independent country at one point. Mm -hmm. And I think that would have been easy. Uh, and then, in fact, if you look at what a lot of the politicians were claiming to fight for, which was their independence and mm -hmm. states' rights, the definition of state states' rights is the states are independent. L likely, and I don't know if this is true, but it's easy to speculate that the South would be Europe today. You would have the, the Kingdom of South Carolina and the, the Republic of Georgia and the, the Grand Duchy of Alabama and, and so forth. And I think... Uh, you have the balkanization of the United exactly. States. Exactly. And then, of course, you mm -hmm. might have had the English come back over uh, because of the natural trading alliance between the English and the southern states because of cotton and tobacco and whatnot. There could have been, a much, there could have been much more to that than just a casual alliance. Who knows? I mean, you can go on and on. With There's this. a strong French presence in Mexico at that time. Sure. Uh, uh, Napoleon III is experimenting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So 
many things could have happened. I think uh, James Thurber has a, a worthwhile story in this topic. Because Grant called, had been drinking at Appomattox. That's right? the one in, in which yeah. he ends a long uh, drunken reminiscence by unbuckling his sword and saying, if I'd been feeling better, we would have whipped you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it surrenders to Lee by, by accident. Uh, it, it is impossible really to say, but it's interesting to string out. Uh, David Long, in his very excellent book on the uh, 1864 election, uh, argues that had the North lost, or had Lincoln rather lost that election and the North then uh, mm -hmm. reached an armistice, you would have had just uh, what you're talking about, Jeff, this balkanization, which would have had the consequence for world affairs that there's no United States for the Allies to turn to in 1917 or again in 1941, right. with the result that most of the known world today is governed by fascist uh, or totalitarian German, states, yes. speaking German mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. uh, If Japanese. Hitler had arisen, interestingly, tomorrow night we are talking with Ron Rosenbaum, who's done an exceptionally interesting book titled Explaining Hitler, yeah. which looks at all the historiography of uh, concerning Hitler and also concerning the Holocaust. And there are so many what-ifs there as well. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite counterfactuals, which I often present to students, trying to test out the nature of uh, theory of history or philosophy of history uh, is and testing out the limits of great man interpretations of the theory of history is this simple counterfactual what if Hitler had died in World War One he was a frontline soldier what if he had been killed what would the history of the world be from there on uh, whether Hitler would have ever arisen if say the South had won the war and if America had turned into the sort of patchwork quilt that you're now talking about exactly. in itself is confounding. I mean, you get into a, like a, a, a Star Trek plot uh, exactly. you know, where you know, one yeah. tiny microcosm event changes everything mm -hmm. that follows and, and you get off into and bizarre uh, you know, speculation and it, it is just speculation I mean, there's no way to, I, to there's no way to nail down a timeline and say this would have happened because um, it's, mm -hmm. it's just fun. What if Grant had been shot down early in the war? Would the North still have won? Uh, depends on who. Well, if if you're asking that question, and on the same the same question, what if Reynolds had not been shot? Mm -hmm. I mean, Reynolds would have succeeded to command eventually. What if Hancock had not been injured at Gettysburg? Likely, he might have succeeded to command. Lincoln was looking for someone capable of getting the job done, mm -hmm. and whoever was that, you know, Grant happened to be the man. By focusing on personalities, though, mm -hmm. there's an implicit argument that it was not simply the weight of numbers for the North that won the war mm -hmm. that that uh, had it not been Grant, had it been men of the caliber of, of, of Fremont or Halleck out in the field, they still could have won the war. It might well, have taken another couple of years. It though. might have taken a lot longer. Mm -hmm. People, I, I, I'm not arguing that it was mm -hmm. simply the weight of numbers that won the war for the North, but these counterfactuals do carry these assumptions. That, but are you arguing, though, that there are some scenarios by which uh, the end outcome might have been a Southern victory? I think so. Or I think was Southern victory impossible? No, I think it was possible, in, uh, and I think they come closer to it in 1864 than any other time in the war. At w through which events? Through the election in the North, the presidential oh, election of 1864. Right. Mm -hmm. the, this, this is a remarkable thing. No nation torn by civil war has ever put its leadership up to an electoral test. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no leader has ever done, had done up to that time what Lincoln had done while he was sending mothers' sons out to be killed offered himself up for their electoral approval. But as he said, this is the American experiment. This is the whole basis of what we are trying to prove, that citizens can govern themselves. If we don't conduct this election, we might as well say that, that we've, we've lost the point of the whole thing. The opposition was? Uh, George McClellan. Right. George, George McClellan, McClellan was the Democratic Who candidate. was the first top general, who had been somewhat discredited, or at least Lincoln had put him aside as not worth much. Well, he was uh, he was not an aggressive man. He was he was a superb mm -hmm. organizer. This was a man who should have had Henry Halleck's job, mm -hmm. and it would might have made a great deal of difference in how the war was run from the northern point of view. But he was not a field commander. How close, uh, how closely, or how decisively did Lincoln win that election? Well, it, when it finally comes down to it, it's fairly decisive. The electoral votes are are overwhelming. But the uh, popular vote is rather close, isn't it? it it's it's substantial enough. The what's critical is not so much the the size of the election victory in November, but looking at chronologically uh, where things stood in the summer of 1864. Mm -hmm. They didn't have polls uh, of the electorate, so you don't know exactly what people were thinking. But we know that as of August 1864, after Grant has been carrying on this uh, brutal campaign against Lee's army, 
the siege of Petersburg is underway. He, Grant has had 100,000 casualties. Sherman is no closer to Atlanta, to taking Atlanta than he was two months earlier. And Lincoln writes a memo, uh, a memorandum, uh, secretly seals it and has his, his cabinet sign it in which he says, uh, it is likely that the administration will not be reelected and therefore you are all pledging to do everything we can to save the union between now and the inauguration of the next president because he will have been elected on such terms as to make saving the union impossible. Hmm. So Lincoln was convinced he's going to lose the election in August of 1864. Well, let's try that one last what if. What if McClellan had won? Well, McClellan was put up on the pedestal by the, the, a lot of people in the peace movement. I mean, clearly his support came from the anti-Lincoln people, uh, the Democrats, and I think McClellan would have, it would have been easy to convince him to enter into to negotiations. The equivalent would have been Gene McCarthy winning the election of 1968. The well, difference, though, although actually that's, uh, that's probably a good comparison on one hand, because McCarthy... Uh, at at the end, when the going, uh, I hate to uh, slam McCarthy because I actually supported him when I was a teenager, uh, but when the going got tough, suddenly he was not there. And McClellan, it has been said of McClellan that he conducted the campaign the same way he fought the war, which is he went halfway and he but, never would quite commit. And, and I want to draw a distinction between McClellan and and mm -hmm. McCarthy, which is McClellan uh, was a war Democrat. He supported the war. Right. Uh, the the Democratic Party at that time adopted a peace platform, and Lincoln recognized they were either going to nominate a war Democrat on a peace platform or vice versa to try to appeal to everyone. But McClellan felt he would be breaking faith with the thousands of soldiers who had died under his command right. if he simply gave up once he was elected. So he more or less repudiated his party's platform, which essentially cost him all, all possible support. Still, I do think had he been elected, there would have been some kind of negotiation. If the fighting stopped for a day, it would have stopped forever. Uh, we pause once again for some commercials. Then let's come to the last phase. That is the war under the control of General Grant and Grant's victories. And uh, we come ultimately to Appomattox and to the surrender, which is a fascinating scene, both in uh, Jeff Shower's new book, The Last Full Measure. Indeed, it's also a fascinating scene in Grant's memoirs, just as Robert E. Lee was finally the great military figure for the Confederacy. Uh, obviously, Ulysses Grant was for the Northern forces, for the Union forces. He's one of the two or three major figures. He's really one of the two major figures in your new book, The Last Full Measure. Uh, how do we take his measure? Well, I I love exploding myths whenever I get the chance. Mm -hmm. and, and writing about Grant, of course, the way we all learn about Grant in high school was, number one, he was drunk all the time, and number two, he was a corrupt politician later, neither of which are true. Uh, I truly enjoyed this character. I went into the research on Grant with a lot of fear because I thought, geez, you know, this guy, if he's sort of a, of a, of a, uh, a stone face or, or someone who just is very one-dimensional, it's going to make the storytelling very difficult. And what I found instead was a marvelous character. His family life, uh, his relationship with his wife, uh, they, have, I mean, they, are, they are in love. I mean, they have a love mm -hmm. affair their entire lives. And uh, even on his deathbed, I mean, he, he's he's thinking of his wife. Um, it's it's a marvelous story, and how Grant relates to all the other madness that's going on around him. And by by that, I mean some of the almost cartoonish behavior of some of the people like George Gordon Meade, and to some extent, people like Phil Sheridan. Um, it was great fun to have Grant as the the pillar of sanity in the middle of a great deal of insanity. Then he wasn't all that much of an alcoholic to begin with. Well, I think by modern standards, I and mean, if you were to, if you were to apply modern terminology to him, I think he was an alcoholic. His mm -hmm. drinking problem began in California in the gold rush days. Uh, everything that I can find about him was that I mean, first of all, it was a serious problem. It was a disciplinary problem. He was offered the choice of uh, facing a court martial or resigning from the army in 1854 he resigns he goes home believing fully believing he'll never be a soldier again that's back to galena illinois right he back back to his family to his wife yeah. Um, he tries a number of different things but before he goes to Galena, actually. Uh, he tries business in St. Louis and so forth. He's a failure, generally, at everything he mm -hmm. does, except to be a soldier. Um, this is a man who is not cut out to be a civilian in any role, and including President of the United States. He had fought uh, in the Mexican War. Yes. Uh, in fact, 
uh, he knew Lee in the Mexican War. He, he was well, never sure that Lee knew him. That's because Lee was on uh, everybody Winfield knew Scott's Lee, right. staff. Uh, Lee he? was very visible. Uh, yeah. Being on the staff of Scott, uh, every major staff officer on, on the commander staff is always visible in a very small yeah. army. Um, Grant, however, was just another infantry commander, and, mm -hmm. I, and it's it's doubtful. And I've heard the, the myths back and forth that Lee actually remembers Grant at Appomattox. I don't believe that's true. I, well, I think, Grant says he does. Well, he says he he hoped he does. I want to read that in a moment. I think yeah. I think Lee is being polite at that probably. moment. Probably, mm -hmm. probably yes. yes. But uh, what was the nature of his military skill, or should we speak of uh, Grant's military genius? Well, I I think you can do that. I think uh, Grant had a remarkable degree of of, of common sense and determination. Uh, he had a. a revelation early in the war when he's leading his troops uh, into battle for the first time towards a suspected Confederate position and he becomes more and more nervous as the troops are approaching until he, he his mouth is dry he uh, he can hardly function he's sure the troops can see that he, he's practically unmanned he, he just can't face this and they get over the hill to the Confederate position and the Confederates are gone and he realizes that the Confederate officer had been just as scared of him as he was Mm -hmm. of the enemy, and he said he never felt fear in battle after that. He realized uh, everyone was on the same playing field. So he had a mastery of himself, uh, with the exception of, of the the, uh, the battle with alcoholism, and there are reasonable accounts that he had at least one relapse during the war when he was in the Western Theater. Uh, but he is uh, really a remarkable character, uh, and his memoirs are not the least of that. They are the finest memoirs to come out of the world. They are. Uh, it's wonderful literature. It's a very significant, great American uh, book. Uh, what's his style militarily? How does he fight? Well, I think what he dis what he brings to the war, which is what I think Lincoln sees in him, mm -hmm. is this is the first commander who understands not how to fight the war. They all know how to fight the war. They all know how to you know, order their troops into combat. They've been doing it now for, for three years. What Grant brings to the to the table is what we must do, a knowledge of what we must do, or an instinct to end the war. Up until now, the war has spun wildly out of control, wildly beyond anybody's expectations, wildly beyond anybody's imagination of what this could have become. It is far exceeded in terms of numbers and blood and, and the carnage of what anyone anticipated. Grant at least brings the foresight or the clarity to see what I have to do to end this war. And he recognizes the, who the enemy is. The enemy is not Richmond. The enemy is not symbols. It's not the flag. It's not Jefferson Davis. The enemy is Robert E. Lee. And if you take Robert E. Lee and his army out of action, that's the end of the Confederacy. And uh, that's a new concept because uh, prior to that, all the commanders, it was on to Richmond. That was always the war cry. Yeah. Richmond was the great symbol. Grant understands Richmond is not that important. The the army out there is is what it was what we're fighting. I would say Abraham Lincoln also recognizes that earlier in the war, uh, during the Gettysburg campaign, when General Hooker is in command uh, in the first days of that campaign, as Lee, Lee goes north, Hooker proposes, "Well, I'll go south and take Richmond, while Lee is off in Pennsylvania." And Lincoln, the untutored civilian, has to remind the West Pointer, "Your objective is not Richmond; it is the enemy's army. That's what you must smash." Uh, Grant recognizes that too, and Grant also has the strength of character to pay the price necessary to defeat Lee's army. Somehow, you, I'm reminded of the opening scene of the great film about General Patton, where in that speech he gives, standing behind that great flag, he tells uh, the soldiers he's talking to, your job is to kill the bastard who's trying to kill you. Exactly, and, uh, and Grant understands that very clearly, uh, and, and he understands also why the Confederates are fighting. And, and I put a scene in the book where there's a conversation with Elihu Washburn, uh, the congressman uh, from Illinois, who's Grant's great friend, uh, and Washburn brings the concerns of Washington with him to the to the camp, and, and, and Washburn is talking about the value of Richmond and Jefferson Davis, and Grant says, no, those fellows over there, when they come screaming into my guns, they're not screaming the name Jefferson Davis. They're fighting for Robert E. Lee. They're mm. fighting for that man. That's where their inspiration comes from. That's why we have to go after Lee. Did uh, Lee was charismatic to his troops? Certainly. Was Grant charismatic to his? Uh, if you compare him to Lee, no, certainly not. <laughs> I mean, I think, he became so in a way. Well, it took a while. I mean, he didn't have that regal bearing. He didn't have that the, the dignified. Uh, I mean, first of all, the Eastern troops. 
weren't ready to accept this man mm-hmm. right off the bat. I mean, the, the, the concept from Meade's camp, particularly the, the, the staff officers around General Meade, was here comes this cowboy who's coming over here with all the authority that Lincoln has given him, and he's going to, you know, they're going to try to make us look bad. They're going to show us, us Easterners how a war is fought. And there was a lot of resentment about uh, uh, Grant's people coming to the East. And, and there, there's some justification for that, too, because well, sure. General Pope had done the same thing, a Western right. general brought to the East, bragging about what Western troops had done in 1862, and his fate is to be clobbered at Second Manassas exactly. by William Jackson. Yeah, but Grant really didn't what well, didn't have that kind of bravado and no. didn't bring that with him, even if maybe some of his staff officers or some of his soldiers might have. Uh, uh, think of, of Grant's first review when mm-hmm. he comes out and reviews the troops, and he, he, he marches along, and the troops, uh, some of them <laughs> cheer for him, as they, they cheered for McClellan from their hearts, they cheered for McClellan's successors because they thought it was the right thing to do. You cheer for your general when he comes by. And Grant rides along, neither looking right nor left, ignoring it. One regiment, uh, maybe to show him, doesn't cheer, just as a military salute with their muskets. Grant stops and returns the salute. It continues on. This sends a message to the army when he gets there that the, 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 the brag and fuss is over. Exactly. I'm here to get a job done. Yes. And he does achieve a charisma through that kind of action. Well, the brag and fuss is, is really the point. Uh, that, that's mm-hmm. a good way to describe it, because that's not what Grant brings to the army, mm-hmm. and it's what almost every other commander before him had brought. The soldiers themselves, they're tired of that. They, they understand. Sounds the like he's the Omar Bradley. The soldier, soldier. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not a bad yeah. analogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does he terminate the war? Well, he understands... What's the end game? The end game is Petersburg. I mean, what he wants, first of all, is for Lincoln, I mean, I'm sorry, for Lee to come out and play. I mean, he wants to face Lee's army mano a mano. I mean, he wants he wants the fight because he knows he will prevail. It's a mathematics equation, and if he doesn't prevail today, he'll prevail tomorrow and or next week. Uh, Lee will not uh, will not play the game. It's a chess match, and what Lee has in his favor by having a smaller army is it's more mobile. He knows the countryside better. The the, the natives are friendly. He can move his army much more quickly with much more efficiency than Grant can. And Lee uses the opportunity. Where are we? We're in Pennsylvania. We're in, we're in, in no. Now we're in Virginia. We're in, in well, Petersburg. Is we're north of Richmond. Before Gettysburg. Right. Is before. Um, um, Appomattox, right, of course. Right, right. Yeah. And what happens is Lee basically maneuvers himself away from Grant at every opportunity, closer and closer to Richmond. Finally, uh, Grant goes around. He simply has enough of this. He realizes Lee isn't going to come out and fight. So Grant goes around him, crosses the James River, surprises Lee by doing so, and ends up down around the crucial rail center of Petersburg, where Lee gets most of his supplies. So Lee eventually, and this is what we were talking about Jefferson Davis before, after a, a, just a horrible... Uh, episode after episode of bad mm-hmm. communication and and ridiculous infighting in the Confederate Army between Beauregard and and so forth. Lee finally goes to Petersburg, takes command. Once Grant begins to strangle Lee's army, and all Grant does is he just again it's the mathematics. He just extends his line slowly, bit by bit. He lengthens the snake that's wrapping around Lee's army. Lee cannot keep up. He does not have the numbers to strengthen his lines and follow Grant as Grant spreads his lines out. That's when Grant clearly understands it's only a matter of time. That is the end game. We might also look back at the the uh, our satellite view of the whole country and what's happening yeah, while certainly. Grant is doing this. Grant uh, is, of course, commander in chief of the, the general in chief of the Union Army. He's, he's with the Army of the Potomac, but he's not actually commanding it. Meade still is. Grant has authority for the forces in the West as well, out in Tennessee and, and Georgia. So he, Grant, explains his plan to Lincoln when he is appointed in early '64, and says, "I will keep Lee busy. I will fight Lee. I will do what what you explained in, in, in such clarity there. I will keep him busy so he can't go anywhere. I will keep extending him." Meanwhile, Sherman is going to go to Atlanta, right. and in due time after taking Atlanta, go march through Georgia to Savannah. At the same time, there are going to be actions uh, taking Mobile Bay and hopefully marching north through Alabama. There are other plans. Uh, Wilmington. Uh, w- mm-hmm. a, a sea invasion through Wilmington, North right. Carolina. A- as Lincoln puts it, those... Uh, those not skinning can hold a leg. Uh, every army has a role to play. They're either going to skin or they're going to hold a leg down, and, and the job will get done. So when the whole end game is played out, although the front lines between Washington and Richmond haven't moved 100 miles in four years, Sherman has marched all the way from Chattanooga to Atlanta to Savannah and back up the coast to North Carolina. He's almost within shouting distance of Lee's army, too. So Lee fights a brilliant campaign, but when he's done... He looks behind him, and the entire Confederacy has been lost. Right. Did Sherman's march through Georgia to Atlanta, did it really ravage the country? Was it really a cruel, 
sort of anti-civilian war as well, well as... No. You're asking two questions. Uh, did it ravage the country? To some extent, he did in that he destroyed farms, he destroyed mm -hmm. crops, he destroyed, the, he destroyed the ability to feed the army from that part of the country. Was it cruel? Was it... Uh, I don't believe so. And I think what Sherman brings... He's still remembered that way in Georgia. I know he? it is. And, and I get... Uh, people right. get in my face about it every now yeah. and then because I paint a little bit of a picture. There, there is a, a brief uh, episode with Sherman when Sherman does come to see Grant at City Point, and mm -hmm. I put Sherman into the book. I was so happy to read that, in fact, Sherman does come to the scene because it's a wonderful character, and I wanted to bring him into the story. But what Sherman understands, Sherman is ahead of his time in the same way that Longstreet is ahead of his time. Longstreet comes up with the concepts of trench warfare a generation or two ahead of his time. What Sherman brings to the, to the equation is this is war, this is what war is. And he tells the civilians, if you are not hurt by this, if the, all you see of the war is occasionally a wooden box comes home with one of your boys in it, uh, if that's the only pain you feel, you have no incentive to make this stop. Again, this is all about ending the war, not mm -hmm. fighting the war. And what Sherman brings to Georgia is, I will show you what a war is, and I will show you what a war can do and the pain that a war can bring. And if I burn your town, maybe then there'll be some incentive to stop this. That, that, that's what it is. Sherman says war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. His march is, is at most 60 miles wide, which if you draw him on a decent-sized map of, uh, of Georgia is only a pencil width of a line. It's not a vast despoiling of the entire state, but it does make the point. The end game is three or four days in April, isn't it? Uh, Petersburg uh, ends on April 2nd. Uh, Five Forks, Virginia, April 3rd. Uh, Amelia Courthouse, April 4th. Uh, Sailors Creek, April 6th. Appomattox, April 9th. It's about a week. Exactly. I mean, uh, considering that these soldiers have spent months in the, the filthy trenches of Petersburg, on the one hand, they're glad to be out of there. On another hand, you have history suddenly cranking up the engines, and uh, the war ends actually fairly quickly. Well, at the very end, and you pr portray this uh, very evocatively, one can see it in uh, uh, the last chapters of The Last Full Measure, uh, Lee's army, which is only about one-tenth the size of the surrounding uh, Union armies, Lee's effective army, yes. Uh, Lee's, mm -hmm. Lee's effective army is also fully in, is fully trapped. Yes. They're totally encircled. Exactly. I mean, there are many points I can make about that. One is that uh, I, I had a real problem, and, and for anyone who's a fan of Phil Sheridan, they probably aren't going to like what I have to say about the man. Uh, when I began researching this book, I wanted to put, and people who are familiar with these books know that occasionally there's a peripheral chapter or a, a chapter from a peripheral character, such as Hancock or Jeb Stewart or Longstreet. I was going to do that with Phil Sheridan, and as I began to do the research on this man, from Chamberlain's point of view, from Joshua Chamberlain's own memoirs, because he's under Sheridan's command, and then also from Grant's memoirs, and, and some of the orders that were going back and forth on the field, I realized that Phil Sheridan, mm -hmm. this is not a nice man, and not mm -hmm. in the same way that you can describe Sherman as a man who simply is efficient in the art of waging war, Sheridan, if unchecked, and in literally it's a matter of minutes, had Grant not arrived on the scene where Sheridan was when Lee's army is completely defeated, laying in front of him on April 9th, um, Sheridan begs Grant, give me five more minutes. And what that meant was Sheridan saw Lee's helpless army right in front of them. It's debatable that he might have killed every one of them. Might have blown them all up. Exactly. And for <coughs> what end, other th I mean, uh, we'll never know, but what that told me is, well, first of all, this was a character I had a very difficult time trying to get into his head. And secondly, had Grant not been there and not said, but don't you know that the truce is already in effect? Haven't you heard that Lee is coming? And you know, Sheridan's response to that is, well, it's a ruse. It's, it's, a, it's trickery on their part to try but to But Lee escape. has, in fact, asked for a meeting with Grant. Exactly. It, it happens on April 9th. Uh, at Appomattox in a private home. What's the, uh, Wilmer, M Wilmer M McLean. The McLean home. Right. I want to read Grant's account of that, as we have it in the memoirs, portion of that at least, um, uh, writing about his meeting with Lee and his taking of the surrender. When I had left camp, now let me go one paragraph before that. I had known General Lee in the old army and had served with him in the Mexican War, but did not suppose, owing to the difference in our age and rank, that he would remember me. Well, I would more naturally remember him distinctly because he was the chief of staff of General Scott in the Mexican War. When I had left camp that morning, I had not expected so soon the result that was then taking place, namely the meeting for the surrender. 
and consequently was in rough garb. I was without a sword, as I usually was when on horseback on the field, and wore a soldier's blouse for a coat with the shoulder straps of my rank to indicate the army to the army who I was. When I went into the house, I found General Lee. We greeted each other, and after shaking hands, took our seats. I had my staff with me, a good portion of whom were in the room during the whole of the interview. What General Lee's feelings were, I do not know. As he was a man of much dignity, with an impassable face, it was impossible to say whether he felt inwardly glad that the end had finally come, or felt sad over the result and was too manly to show it. Whatever his feelings, they were entirely concealed from my observation. But my own feelings, which had been quite jubilant on the receipt of his letter, were sad and depressed. I felt like anything rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly, and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought, and one for which there was the least excuse. I do not question, however, the sincerity of the great mass of those who were opposed to us. General Lee was dressed in a full uniform, which was entirely new, and was wearing a sword of considerable value, very likely the sword which had been presented by the state of Virginia. At all events, it was an entirely different sword from the one that would ordinarily be worn in the field. In my rough traveling suit, the uniform of a private, with the straps of a lieutenant general, I must have contrasted very strangely with a man so handsomely dressed, six feet high, and a faultless form. But this was not a matter that I thought uh, about until afterwards. We soon fell into a conversation about old army times. He remarked that he remembered me very well in the old army, and I told him that as a matter of course I remembered him perfectly. But from the difference in our rank and years, there being about 16 years difference in our ages, I thought it very likely that I had not attracted his attention sufficiently to be remembered by him after such a long interval. A conversation grew so pleasant that I almost forgot the object of our meeting. After the conversation had run on in this style for some time, General Lee called my attention to the object of our meeting and said that he had asked for this interview for the purpose of getting from me the terms I proposed to give his army. I said that I meant merely that his army should lay down their arms, not to take them up again during the continuance of the war, unless duly and properly exchanged. He said that he had so understood my letter. Then we gradually fell off again into conversation about matters foreign to the subject which had brought us together. This continued for some little time, when General Lee again interrupted the course of the conversation by suggesting the terms I proposed to give his army ought to be written out. I called to General Parker, secretary on my staff, for writing materials and commenced writing out the following terms. Uh, what an interesting scene. He is awed by Robert E. Lee, and he's sad for him, and he feels himself somehow inferior to him. He is responding to the charism of Robert E. Lee, just as Lee's troops did. When General Lee again interrupted the course of the conversation by suggesting the terms I proposed to give his army ought to be written out, I called to General Parker, secretary on my staff, for writing materials and commenced writing out the following terms. Uh, what an interesting scene. He is awed by Robert E. Lee, and he's sad for him, and he feels himself somehow inferior to him. He is responding to the charism of Robert E. Lee, just as Lee's troops did. Absolutely. Uh, I, in the last full measure, I take that scene, uh, you see that scene, I take the reader through that scene through Grant's point of view, yeah. because, it, because that's so important to see Lee, for Grant to see Lee, as we have seen him all along. Uh, if, if, if you are familiar with my stories or my father's stories, it's, it's a wonderful revelation when Grant first sees this man and feels that slight sense of embarrassment mm -hmm. over the way he's dressed compared to the way Lee is dressed. It's an extraordinary moment, and uh, it, it, that was one of the, the special things about writing a story like The Last Full Measure, is always knowing that moment's out there and, and having the pleasure of writing it. People have asked you this a thousand times. I try to avoid questions that people ask a thousand times. Still, it's relevant. You've done a fictionalized or a novelized version of this history, very uh, loyal to and very uh, uh, obedient to every detail of the history, as far as we have all the details, but still you've gone inside the heads, the spirits, uh, the sensibilities of the main actors, and you've given them 
dialogue, which we don't have any direct record of. Um, it's a difficult task you've set for yourself. How do you hold yourself in check to remain a loyal historian, even while doing a, lo a novelized version? Well, first of all, what makes it a novel, by definition, is the, the thoughts put in, that I'm putting into the characters' minds, the dialogue, the facts, the, the events, the history I am painstaking about, because uh, it would be easy to start playing games with history and stick some character in some place where he was not, just to make my storytelling convenient. If I was to do that, the book loses all credibility. It shouldn't be published, and I have a real problem with people who do that. Uh, I was very, very careful about getting the facts straight. M much of what you just read, I mean, Appomattox, the, the events that <coughs> took place in that room, are probably one of the most well-chronicled you know, couple of hours in yeah. American history. Everybody wrote down you know, who had the pencil and where the paper was and what the shape of the table was every detail so that was the easy part was getting the, the facts right but beyond that it's it's getting to know who these characters are by hearing their voices I mean that's the magic that my father experienced in writing the killer mm -hmm. angels I mean he he said during the writing he was visited by every character in his story I thought that was a strange thing to say now I know exactly what he meant that you have you, to get to the point where you hear their yeah. voices and you probably bathed yourself in you Absolutely. plunged into yes every memoir ever written yes. by anybody as well right. as every history. every letter I could find every diary every account by anyone who was there um, fortunately for me because of the things like Ken Burns, the, the popular interest in the Civil War mm -hmm. now, from the film Gettysburg, from my father's book, there's an enormous amount of material available now that simply was not available a generation ago when my father was doing his research. So literally, with a phone call, uh, I could accumulate a wonderful library of original sources that were almost impossible to find when my father was doing his research. Yeah. Uh, we will pause. A quick round of commercials, then it is time to get to the phones. We're opening the lines this instant. The number, of course, 591-7200, 591-7200. Any question you'd like to raise, any uh, theory you'd like very briefly to uh, uh, recount, we welcome your call. 591-7200. If you're calling from uh, way down south in the land of cotton, then uh, you want to use the area code 312, then 591-7200. Our lines, as I see, are completely filled at the moment. Therefore, others who are trying to reach us are not succeeding. Your best strategy is, of course, to call again after we say goodnight to some prior caller. Uh, a quick word about the museum, and then we'll go to the phones. Sure. It is the largest museum focused on Lincoln in the world, I guess. That's right. It, it's, uh, it's been in Fort Wayne since 1928, uh, built originally by the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company, which uh, owes its name to the Lincoln family, received permission from mm -hmm. Robert Lincoln to use that name and today contains one of the world's great collections of material dealing with Abraham Lincoln. Open to the public whenever they come by? Uh, we're open uh, Tuesday through Sunday, uh, 10 to 5, mm -hmm. Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5, Sunday 1 to 5. What is this location in Fort Wayne? It's uh, it's on the corner of Clinton and Berry Streets in downtown Fort Wayne, hard to miss. Mm -hmm. There's a big cannon uh, in the lobby mm -hmm. pointing at the traffic as you go by. and. Uh, uh, again, gives you uh, a chance for sort of interactive uh, educational experience dealing with Abraham Lincoln. Good. Now with that, let us go quickly to the phones. Here is the first caller. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my question is more about maybe the Reconstruction period, but I wondered if there was any sentiment on the northern side to put uh, Jefferson Davis on trial for treason or Alexander Stevens or the other high uh, leaders of the Confederacy well, or he, even Lee he, and why, and you would think that they would have been led to the gallows if they had been put on, on trial and, and why that didn't happen. Davis was in prison for a few years. He was he? in prison for a couple of years. They fully intended, I mean, his, the, the radical Republicans who took charge of the government really uh, with Andrew Johnson fully intended to treat Davis uh, in the way they thought he should be treated. Uh, in fact, his prison term was un unbelievably cruel and uh, dehumanizing. Uh, but the trial never happened and I think uh, cooler heads prevailed realizing there nothing would be gained uh, that after all what they were trying to do was get on with things and by opening the old wounds it would have accomplished nothing. Lincoln had desired to let the Confederates go. He, he uh, told the story of the uh, reformed drinker who uh, asks a friend for a glass of lemonade and says but if you could put a drop of whiskey in it unbeknownst to me that would be all right. Uh, similarly he said if Jefferson Davis could escape the country unbeknownst to me <coughs> that would be all right. Uh, Robert E. Lee, of course, was treated with great honor. Indeed, he then became president of Washington University, which was 
whose name was then changed. Was it only after his death it was changed to Washington right. and Lee? It was changed after his death, yeah. right, when, his, when his son, Custis, became president. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interesting... Did he did he write his own memoirs? No, he did not. Uh, it was he was begged by everyone to write his memoirs. Yeah. A couple of points on that. First of all, Lee, uh, in some of his attempts at writing, it turned out that he was not a very good writer, mm -hmm. and, and his memoirs would have been nothing like Grant's. And secondly, mm -hmm. Lee would not pass judgment on his own people. And w and when he was asked to begin writing accounts, when uh, Walter Taylor, who was his, his uh, adjutant, began to accumulate research materials for him, he realized that if he does write his memoirs, he's going to have to judge the people who served yeah. under him, and he simply didn't want to get involved in that. Our thanks to the first caller, and let's go quickly to the next. Good evening, you're on the air. Good evening, Dr. Rosenberg and guests. Yes, sir. Uh, I guess my, guess my question focuses on Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, and quickly trying to get to the point of the question. Um, Lincoln writes in a letter to uh, Albert Hodges in 64 that if, if he had not freed the slaves, that the war would have been lost. In a, he says, Lincoln says in this letter, in about a year or so, give or take. Uh, and I'd like the guest to comment on that. And then secondly, and then I'll hang up and listen, uh, for Mr. Prokopovich, um, I'm li I just received my uh, brochure on the Lincoln Colloquium I usually visit, and could you give us a little preview uh, as to your uh, talk that's going to be entitled Abraham Lincoln's Good War? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll quickly address the second one. Uh, I, I can't give a preview because I'm not fully sure what I'm going to say, uh, but the Lincoln Colloquium, which is sponsored by the Lincoln Home in Springfield, is a, a very uh, good event. It happens every year. Uh, this coming year it's going to be, I believe, in uh, Galesburg. Every alternate year it will be in Springfield. In year 2000, we will host it at the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne. Uh, so it will continue to move around and reach more people. Uh, I hope you can come to that. Regarding the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Lincoln felt very strongly about this issue. Uh, I, I would not speculate on why he said he thought the war would be lost without it, but it certainly was a turning point in the war in a number of ways, the greatest of which was that it added a moral dimension to the Union cause that had not been there before. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier that Union soldiers did not go to war thinking of slavery in 1861, and I think that's largely true, but many of them were radicalized by their exposure to slavery during the war, and although there was a lot of disaffection with the proclamation uh, when Lincoln issued it, in time most Northerners came to support it. They saw that slavery was a pillar of the Southern War effort, and by uh, declaring war on slavery, it rallied the North, it ended the possibility of foreign intervention, and it, especially important, it made available uh, 180,000 uh, African-American soldiers and sailors who joined the Union cause after that. Is it true that there were some black units within the Army of the Confederacy? Well, this is, this, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> units, is a, it, you're implying whole entire regiments. There may have been individual blacks who fought uh, actually slaves who accompanied their masters mm -hmm. into combat and picked up their master's rifle when the guy went down. I mean, that's the, that's a more romanticized version, but uh, I mean, certainly that probably happened. Uh, but as far as organized black units in the None whatsoever. No. No, the, the Southern, uh, near, near the end of the war, the, the uh, Confederate officials in desperation began considering the idea of equipping slaves, and as Howell Cobb of Georgia said, <laughs> If slaves will make good soldiers, then our whole theory of slavery is wrong. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to admit slaves to the cause would have falsified the whole nature of the Confederacy. There is a current uh, fad or a rumor, that uh, a belief among people who want to negate the moral aspects of the war, that there were lots of black Confederates. Yeah. Uh, and the historical evidence for this is such that no serious historian believes Well, I'd rather suspect that. I've seen some such uh, claims made in recent years. Uh, on to another caller. Good evening, you're on the air. Good evening, Doctor. Uh, along the same line, no mention was made of probably the most important day in American history, certainly the bloodiest, and that's the Great Battle of Antietam, which mm -hmm. allowed the Emancipation Proclamation to be issued, and which possibly kept Great Britain out of the war. Uh, I would like to have the comments from you, and also about the lost order, which brought about the battle. Well, surely, the Battle of Antietam. Well, that's one of those, again, what we were talking before about the what-ifs. I mean, that's one of those enormous what-ifs, because that was Lee's first invasion, which may have resulted in a Gettysburg or something in Pennsylvania uh, a year sooner. Uh, and, in fact, it, uh, the Battle of Antietam was an accident, and McClellan got very lucky by his soldiers finding the lost orders, finding Lee's instructions uh, wrapped around cigars, uh, 
it's it's a fascinating story. The the impact of Antietam as a battle, um, what that did is it it showed that Lee's strategy was premature. That he simply did not have the muscle to invade North to go into Pennsylvania yet, and that McClellan still was a commander capable of stopping him. And again, it's another one of those what ifs because McClellan had Lee's army backed up against the Potomac mm. River and probably could have crushed Lee's army had he been aggressive and simply didn't do it. Now, it, yes, it is the single bloodiest day in American mm. history. How bloody was that? Uh, something like what, 24,000, 22,000 men were killed over the course or died over, as a result of the fight. I mean, it was there, a, just a horrific. Killed, wounded, and missing. Right. Was... What's the total measure of casualties, uh, war dead particularly? Uh, approximately 600,000 uh, in excess of that. Uh, it's always difficult to measure. To totaling from both sides. From both right. sides. Jim, right. James McPherson, the, the historian, makes the, the point that that was, mm -hmm. at the time, 2% of the American mm -hmm. population, yes. which magnified to today, you're talking about nearly 6 million people. Would we tolerate a war today where we lost 6 million Americans? On our own soil. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The, the point about Antietam being a critical day also refers to the Emancipation Proclamation, which uh, Lincoln had written uh, the sum in the summer leading up to that uh, battle in September of 1862. He'd read it to his cabinet, and they advised him not to issue it yet because the Union was on a losing streak militarily, and it would have sounded, uh, Secretary of State Seward said, like our last shriek on the retreat if we issue this call for, for black emancipation now. So Lincoln uh, essentially put it in his back pocket and waited for a Union victory. Antietam's really a tactical draw, but it's close enough to a victory mm -hmm. over Robert E. Lee that it allows Lincoln five days later to issue the proclamation. What do we know about the inner Lincoln during all of this time? Um, to preside over a war in which ultimately 600,000 Americans are killed, and I suppose another million significantly injured, um, that must have been a great test of conscience and a test of... Uh, it, we know he was a depressive at times. And well, he had good reason to be depressed. I well, yes, I, 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 I'm not a medical doctor, so I, I won't say he was or was not manic depressive, but his, his ex experiences of depression are always uh, linked to very depressing events in yeah. his life, like uh, the death of a child. Uh, uh, as far as the inner Lincoln, I, I guess one clue to that is to look at the outer Lincoln and the, the wonderful photographs of, of uh, Matthew Brady and Anthony Berger and, and the other photographers of the war. Uh, we have a wall in our museum of uh, dozens of photographs of Lincoln chronologically arranged through the war years, and the aging process uh, is so vivid when you look at them in in order and see the relatively young man. He was only 51 when he mm -hmm. became president, uh, one of the youngest presidents uh, ever to be elected. And then, then the man we think of as Father Abraham, uh, still only 56 years old, not an old man, but he looks ancient uh, by the time he has suffered the, the stress of those four years of war. It's interesting, you see something similar, I think, uh, with Franklin Roosevelt, who during the war years seems to age very quickly mm -hmm. and looks quite harrowed in photographs taken a month before his death. And, and like Lincoln, does not survive uh, yeah. to, to yeah. savor the victory. Uh, five nine one seven two double zero. the number. You are next on the air. Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'm a little puzzled by, by tac military tactics of the Civil War. When I see reenactors and then read accounts of the different battles, it seems that both sides would would uh, well the South would have their rebel yell and and charge in some suicide mm -hmm. charge right into the into the guns of the enemy. Whereas back in the War of 1812, uh, you know the, the the line the old line is uh, old Hickory said we can take them by surprise if we don't fire fire our muskets till we look them in the eyes. I mean, what happened to guerrilla warfare of of uh, of that earlier time, if indeed there there ever was guerrilla warfare as we know it? But why why didn't they why did they have these mass charges or or am I not uh, seeing accurate representations when I see they, reenactments. They did have these mass charges in the Revolutionary War in 1812 and Napoleon's Wars. Uh, in any war, uh, the mass charges take place. Uh, you can't defeat the enemy without defeating uh, the main military force of the enemy. Guerrilla warfare is practiced in, in uh, the southern colonies in the Revolution. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it isn't decisive. It's not going to settle things. Well, one of the points about Old Hickory's line is that, first of all, uh, he's on the defensive. The British are, in fact, walking right in straight line right into his guns. And secondly, his guns aren't very good. So it's necessary to wait till you can see the whites of their eyes or look mm -hmm. them in the eye. Uh, what happens in the Civil War is that the old Napoleonic ways of fighting the war, which all these officers have been schooled in in West Point, uh, that's the only way war was ever fought, because the guns were never very good. By the, by the 1860s, the guns are much, much better. The commanders don't get it. I mean, the commanders are still sending their men in neat, straight lines. And what happens by Gettysburg, really after Gettysburg, the shovel becomes as important as the musket. And the idea of what, why Longstreet is so far ahead of his time is because he champions the idea of digging a trench, putting up a pile of dirt. Well, even if some of the commanders don't get it after Gettysburg, those guys on the front line very much get it. The idea of, of uh, doing another Pickett's Charge, or in Grant's case, doing another Cold Harbor, uh, has no appeal at all to those guys in the front line. And they quickly, uh, it, the way of fighting a war quickly changes. So the war towards an end turns into an artillery war, does it? Well, artillery, trench war, a war of attrition, yeah. certainly. Our thanks to the caller, and quickly on to the next. Hello, you're on the air. Yes, I had two quick questions. One was on uh, Gettysburg. In retrospect, should Lee have certainly retreated at least after the first day or never gotten involved in Gettysburg? And what is the assessment of Winfield Scott and John Mosby? Well, I'll answer the first question. Uh, I think... Uh, first of all, Lee won the first day at Gettysburg. I mean, Lee really chased the Union Army, the 11th Corps, the 1st Corps, chased them back through the town uh, and pretty much had his way. Uh, what they failed to do, which is legend, is that uh, Dick Ewell failed to capture Cemetery Hill, which probably would have meant there would have been no Battle of Gettysburg. It would have been fought somewhere else. Uh, but whether he should have retreated or not, I don't think retreat was an option. He was the invader. I mean, he was there to make a point, and the point was still right in front of him. Even without Jeb Stewart, you know, how much fault did he carry on that? Well, uh, there's great debate about that. There's a lot of revisionism about that. I personally believe that, that Stuart was uh, not where he, Lee needed him to be, and that, in fact, the, I mean, the Battle of Gettysburg was an accident. I mean, Lee did not want a fight there. He was not ready for a fight. His army was spread out all over the countryside, and it was just bad fortune. And it was bad fortune for John Buford and, and ultimately good fortune for John Reynolds that uh, the things unfolded the way they did. But the first day was Lee's was Lee's victory. And didn't Longstreet want him to go around the... Uh, well, that was the, that was the second day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Addressing the other part of the question, Winfield Scott uh, was the, the ranking Union general at the beginning of the war, a veteran of Mexico of 1812 for that matter, 75 years old, uh, and not really uh, physically capable of leading troops in the field. A big fat man, wasn't he? By that a time big he was. old fat mm -hmm. man. Yes, yeah. but a clear thinking one, and uh, the he came up with the strategic plan for the what was called the Anaconda Plan to strangle the South by the blockade, as we, as we uh, talked about earlier, uh, by surrounding uh, the South by taking the Mississippi River Valley and cutting the South in two. Uh, so although he was not able to exercise that much influence on the war directly, uh, he did have a very clear insight as to the strategic plan necessary to win. Our thanks to the caller. Um, one of our listeners asks via email, and I'll just read this. Please have your guests provide detailed insights about Joshua Chamberlain. Well, Chamberlain is is an interesting character. Clearly, my father left us the legacy of Chamberlain outside the state of Maine prior to the Killer Angels. Most people had never heard of Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, what my father discovered was a lot of himself, and that's why he elevated that character uh, to the status that he did. I mean, here's a college professor who rises to the occasion, becomes an extraordinary war hero. Um, and I mean, what Chamberlain did, uh, the reason why my father's book is taught at West Point, at every military academy mm -hmm. in the country, is they teach the idea of command in the field under fire, making an appropriate decision, the right decision, acting in a forward-thinking way while under fire, uh, which is exactly what Chamberlain does. That's why he wins a Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did at Little Round Top. Chamberlain becomes a very good soldier, and I say becomes because he certainly didn't start out that mm -hmm. way. He was no soldier at all. By the end of the war, he is held in such esteem that even Grant picks him uh, above every other officer in the Army. Grant picks him to receive the surrender of Lee's troops. That's not an accident. Grant did not pull names out of a hat. It, uh, it's something of a, a, <coughs> a tribute to the brilliance of your father's book, Jeff, I think, that, that Chamberlain is as well-known today as he is. Right. Because 
another way of looking at it is he is one of dozens of brigadier generals sure. in the Union Army. He is uh, he is not on a par with Grant or Lee as a major figure in the American Civil War. Uh, in terms of human interest, uh, it's hard to excel the story of Joshua. He, he goes on to be a four-term governor of Maine, right. then becomes president of Bowdoin College, and isn't he alive on the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg? Yes. Yeah, he, he does not attend. That uh, There's a debate about that, but in fact, uh, he uh, he goes there uh, three months before. To, to visit as, the battlefield well, part again. Of the he's part of the yeah. planning committee. Right. And he's there in that spring, but he is taken ill. He does not actually attend the 50th. Yeah. Uh, and he dies in February of 1914, a few months after that. Yeah. Are th there are no veterans of the Civil War left, but there are... Children of Civil War veterans, yes. surely. Yes, I have met. I met a woman in Spokane, Washington, whose father fought under Grant at Fort Donelson. Uh, he was 16 when he lied about his age and enlisted in the army. He was 75 years old when she was born in 1920. Hmm. I mean, that's a first-generation connection. I love that because what that tells us certainly tells me this is not ancient history. These yeah. these people are us. A number of our listeners have asked uh, how they uh, find you on the on the web. We have a, a website. At the uh, address is www.thelincolnmuseum, all one word, dot org. That's O R G. Thelincolnmuseum.org. That's right. Mm -hmm. Must be a lot of good stuff on the site. Well, it, it's got some interesting uh, uh, educational material, some uh, uh, questions frequently asked about Abraham Lincoln, uh, some uh, speeches and writings of Lincoln, uh, some illustrations of our exhibit as well. And it, mm -hmm. We do well. And with that, back to the phones. Here is the next caller. Good evening. Yes, I am wondering why the British did not uh, side with the Confederacy and obtain all that cotton. Or wasn't that cotton that important to them? Or perhaps their navy was busy doing something else at the time. What, what really happened? Well, didn't they sort of half side with the Confederacy? Well, in, in, maybe philosophically. I mean, they, um, uh, they, they made a lot of noise about it, but I think there were two reasons. One is they did not want a direct confrontation with the United States government. And when, once the ports were blockaded, you had uh, independent British blockade runners, but there would be no official uh, British naval intrusion to try to break up the blockade because that's an act of war, and there would have been war with the United States. That's one reason. Well, they, But the, the British government considered war with the United States, Certainly in December 1861, the Trent Affair, when a, a headstrong a Union naval captain seized two Confederate envoys on their way to Britain, uh, this was taken by Britain as an insult to their diplomatic uh, prerogatives. And at one point, Seward, Secretary of State uh, Seward of the Union, was proposing that uh, Lincoln go ahead and provoke a war, that this would bring the South back loyally to the flag to fight the, the British one more time. Lincoln wisely said, one war at a time, and this didn't happen. The British didn't join the, uh, recognize the Confederacy, uh, I think in large part, uh, because cotton was, although it was important, it was not the only issue, it was economically important, but the, the workers of Britain supported the Union cause, uh, even though many of them were put out of work by the, the cotton blockade, and especially after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, and slavery was drawn as a clear distinction between the two sides, it would have been politically impossible for any modern European nation to endorse the Confederacy. I, I didn't realize that there was that much public support in Britain for um, for the North Side. There was. There were rallies there. Lincoln wrote a letter to the the working men of Manchester, uh, I believe, uh, which was published in Britain. There was a sort of class division within Britain over this. Uh, the upper class w enjoyed watching the spectacle of the American experiment coming to an end. This was proving what they knew all along. You need an aristocracy. You need a queen or a king to govern your... Exactly. Your the South people. was a feudal system. Yeah. And, and the South was proving that that's what you need. You need uh, essentially an aristocracy, a planner aristocracy, to govern your ignorant peasants. Uh, the British leaders liked that. Uh, the British hmm. workers did not. They sided with the North, and uh, ultimately there was no political consensus in Britain to recognize the South. Uh, thank you. We thank you, sir, for the call. And you are next on the air. Good evening. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was uh, curious. I'm a Southerner myself, and I really enjoy this conversation uh, uh, that uh, that your guests have been carrying on. And um, I wanted to uh, know, uh, you know, I constantly hear about that uh, slavery has always been the issue. That's what the South fought for was to preserve that institution. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, <clears throat> The, uh, the theory is that about 75% of the Southern soldiers uh, did not own a slave, did not even know anybody that owned a slave. 
And so the question has all has always come up: Were these Southern soldiers out there fighting? valiantly as they did in order to make sure that an elite class of people hung on to their slaves? Or was it really more to them an issue of states' rights? I, 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 uh, do, do you follow what I'm saying? I do. I, I, let me address one part of your, your statement, sure. which is uh, you're correct that 25% of white Southern families did own slaves, so 75% did not. Right. Those who did not did, however, often know others who did. The the issue of whether people actually owned slaves or not is something of a red herring. It, it's like saying today, uh, why do men care about abortion? They're never going to have one. Uh, you can have a very strong political opinion about something even if you have no personal uh, experience of it. And to the Southern... I think that's a little bit different, but I won't argue the point with you. Well, That's a life and death matter, but go ahead. The The other point is that the existence of slavery created the opportunity for a real egalitarianism in the South, a sense of an equality among all uh, white males, all, all who had the right to vote. Uh, without that, you have some people who are at the very bottom rung, and as a result, you have really strong support for the Confederate cause and for the institution of slavery among the poorer whites of the South, who not only don't own slaves, but have no realistic chance of ever saving enough money to buy a slave, because the one thing that separates them from the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder is the black rung below them. And the, the, the poorest, least educated white southerner is still superior in every political way. Sir, we're going to plug out because of the noise from your uh, car phone. Okay. But, but stay with us uh, on the radio. What's your view of the same? Yeah, part? I think this is where maybe Jerry and I have a little bit of a disagreement because I feel like from the letters I've read that an enormous number of southern soldiers could care less about slaves. And a lot of them perceive either because of their own experience or because of what their politicians were telling them that their land was under siege, their state was under siege, their independence, their way of life. And that way of life certainly included slavery for some of them, but certainly did not for a great many others. And I think an awful lot of these fellows that picked up a musket and went to fight the war were not fighting so that that rich guy down the road in the mansion could keep his darkies. I mean, uh, that, and, and a lot of the letters, in fact, say exactly that, uh, quote, uh, you know, I don't care much for the darkies one way or the other. I don't even think about it. There's a lot of letters like that. Um, it just wasn't a, an issue worth dying for to a great number of Confederate soldiers. Uh, I think much, <clears throat> the, many more of them perceived the threat to their property, real or imagined, uh, or programmed into them by their leaders, uh, but rather than picking up a gun to defend the institution of slavery. Do, do you know of the existence of the League of the South today? You're talking about the precursor to the to the Klan? No, 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 no. There is a League of the South. I mean, today. Today, which is uh, essentially a populist uh, states' right or uh, states' rights organization, and there are some people, uh, Southern intellectuals, and for that matter, Northern intellectuals, sort of anti-federalists, who uh, still argue that secession was a legitimate right. Oh, I've heard this, that, that in fact the Constitution is very clear that the states absolutely had the right to secede. Yeah. And, and there's a, I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to accept that today as, as, a, as, as a legitimate argument, but there are people making that argument. That, that, uh, that's mm -hmm. true. You do hear that argument. I, I think it, it's, it's a moot point. It was settled at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, right. uh, uh, regardless of what the Constitution If I don't totally cares. misrepresent him, uh, uh, sometime guest on this program, um, Tom Fleming of the Rockford Institute, an editor of their magazine chronicles uh, argues that um, secession is a right that can and should be held in reserve by American states even to this day. It, it may be like the right of revolution, which may may exist, uh, mm -hmm. but there is no corresponding obligation on the part of the governing party to yield to the right of revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, very well, if you want to exercise your right to secession, you have to win the war first. Exactly, and I think that's exactly what would happen, is all you would do by trying to secede uh, is you would just prompt the federal government to do exactly what they did in 1861. Well, I think they would have to. <laughs> uh, the precedent has long been established. Yes, exactly. Back to the phones. Here is the next caller. Hello, you're on the air. Yes, hello, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, gentlemen. Uh, Doctor, I'm wondering if your guest can clarify for me an event which I just recently learned about, which apparently occurred immediately after the Civil War, in which uh, one of the Union generals, who was Irish by heritage, uh, gathered a group of uh, Irish 
soldiers from the Civil War and attempted to invade Canada to kick the British out of Canada. Can can you confirm or clarify this? I can neither confirm nor deny that. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, I'm with you on that. I, I This is not something I'm familiar with. I'm sorry. Well, Where'd you get that, sir? Uh, the, the, infor- raids? the information uh, that I got was from tapes uh, uh, the Irish in America uh, from the History Channel, mm-hmm. in which it was stated that there was uh, uh, Irish on both sides, uh, the Union and the South, and that right. even at one point, two of the generals... Uh, who were one Confederate, one Irish, faced each other in battle, and one sent a letter to the other saying, when this is all over, why don't we get an army together, go back to Ireland, and kick the British out? That's implying that they knew this was going to be all over at some point. That sounds pretty apocryphal to me. Sir, we thank you for the (laughs) call, and we'll go to a less apocryphal call. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, hello. Uh, my question uh, centers around, I think, one of the great southern ironies in the war, and that is the Battle of Chancellorsville. Because mm-hmm. in Chancellorsville, we have uh, Lee's, I've, I've heard it called Lee's masterpiece, yet and that's after that battle, Stonewall Jackson is lost. I'd like to see your guest and have your guest comment on whether you believe that was Lee's masterpiece, and had uh, Stonewall Jackson not been shot by his own soldier, would Gettysburg have been affected? The only thing I've seen your book, your new book, faulted for in one review, just one of a number, is that you have Lee mourning Stonewall Jackson too long. That Lee seems too preoccupied with the death of Stonewall Jackson. Well, Stonewall Jackson was a symbol. I mean, very much to not just to Lee, but to the army, and Lee felt a deep personal loss. Um, but I mean, I think Chancellorsville was a masterpiece for Lee. Of course, not part of the planning was that Stonewall would be shot by his own men, and of course, he was not killed at the battle. He was he died of pneumonia, so uh, he might have died of pneumonia anyway had the battle never even been fought. Uh, but clearly, I mean, what he did is he drove two and a half times his own strength from the field in a complete defeat. Uh, Hooker totally withdrew across the river, pulled his army completely away from Lee. It was probably the South's most one-sided, with the exception maybe of Second Bull Run, uh, it was a complete and utter victory for, the, for Lee. Um, so it's easy to, to measure it as, as a stroke of genius. Which brings up an interesting point about Civil War battles generally. Uh, I, I think uh, Chancellorsville is Lee's tactical masterpiece, but a month later the Union Army is back ready to fight again at Gettysburg. Right. Lee loses at Gettysburg, but a few months later he's ready to fight at Mine Run, which never happens, and then in the 1864 campaign. All these battles, to some extent, draw more attention than they merit because they're so indecisive. They exactly. fight them over again and again and again. And while they're entertaining, they really are not uh, the decisive elements of the war. No, and that's a point I, we were making, I think, in the last hour, is that the, what Grant brings to the equation is not just the ability to fight the war. They've demonstrated for years mm-hmm. that they're very good at fighting the war, but no one has yet figured out exactly how to end the war. And that's what Grant brings to, to the Eastern Theater. We thank the caller, and gentlemen, we just have a few minutes left, so my apologies to those who may still be waiting on the lines, but... Let's um, try to generalize out from all of this or draw some conclusions. I suppose the ultimate conclusion is, what did the war do? The ultimate issue is, what did the war do to us, apart from holding the Union together? There's a a, a scene at the end of the war when Chamberlain is organizing the surrender uh, that is widely quoted and is beautifully portrayed uh, in your book, Jeff, where uh, Chamberlain has the Union soldiers salute the fallen enemy Mm. uh, as they are surrendering at Appomattox, and General Gordon, the Confederate general, returns the salute. What is always left out of these accounts is what happens next, in, according to Chamberlain's memoirs. Another Confederate general, General Wise, uh, in response to Chamberlain's overture, I hope we can uh, reunite, says, you are mistaken, sir. We hate you, sir. And uh, that, that this is not easily forgotten. This was not just a, a big camping trip football game competition between two regions like the Blue-Gray College All-Star game. Uh, there are deep ideological issues that continue to divide the country. Yes, I mean, clearly, I mean, what Chamberlain is gesturing is the fact that we are, in fact, one country, 
militarily we have proven that we beat you you know our idea prevails over your idea but that being said that doesn't mean you can wipe that idea away mm -hmm. and one of the things i mean this is the the great loss to the south is is the is lincoln the death of lincoln and even robert e lee understands this probably more clearly than, than many people in the north is the death of lincoln is the worst single thing that could have happened to the south because lincoln understood we need to get on with this lincoln did not want reprisals he did not want to punish the southerners he wanted to bring it all back together again once he was killed that was the end of that and there would be reprisals and those are the wounds I think that are still deep today though, though Lincoln would have been harsher than I think many people imagine well but, I think he would not have been as 